Welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to have you all here. Uh, While well, the participants are joining the conference room, I'm going to introduce your book. Um, so today the book that's going to be presented is Accumulating Capital Today. Uh, we are very happy that six of the authors joined us tonight. So we have with us uh, Marlène Banquet, Théo Bourgeron, Fabien Fourreau, Anna Anoukantola, Anna Kousela, and Samuel Weeks. So hello everyone and thank you for being with us tonight. Um, this book explores the renewal uh, of forms of capital accumulation and the institutions that shape it. Um, so before Thomas uh, is going to make a quick introduction, uh, I want to introduce also our cycle of debates, so the debates on equality is a cycle that um, is dedicated to the presentation of books recently published in social sciences and dealing with inequalities. Uh, our program is available on our website, with.world, wid.world. Um, so Thomas, uh, the floor is yours for an introduction. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, let me be very, very quick because we have a lot of speakers uh, today. So, so we are very glad to have this, uh, you know, group of um, scholars uh, presenting this collective book, so accumulating capital today, contemporary strategies of profit and dispossessive policies. And I, I should say we will again have uh, Marlene and Theo talk about another book in a couple of weeks or in, in May. I, I don't remember which date exactly about their new book in French, um, La Finance Autoritaire. Uh, but this will be a very uh, different uh, presentation. So today, this is going to be about this collective uh, book, Accumulating Capital Today. Let me simply say that this book partly originates from a, a conference uh, with the same uh, title that was uh, organized by Marlene, Theo, and others uh, in uh, Paris, at Paris Dauphine, that was already uh, in June 2019, so almost two years ago. Um, well, yeah, almost two years ago. And I was very fortunate to, uh, you know, to, to participate at this conference, and I was very uh, impressed by the diversity and the energy that, uh, that, that we could see in this conference with people coming from very different discipline approaches and developing these uh, 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 different uh, approaches to, to, to capital accumulation, broadly, broadly speaking. And I, you know, it was really a very exciting conference and, and, and very impressive to see all this new generation or sometimes even less new generation, but, uh, you know, coming together and, and presenting all this work. So this book is, is, uh, is really a great uh, testimony to this uh, energy and to, to all this uh, very exciting research that uh, Barlet and Theo have, have put together. So I'm going to stop there for now. Uh, uh, so I let you, you know, we, you organize the time between the different speakers. In principle, we try not to go beyond one hour so that we have time for questions after that. But on the other hand, there are many speakers and we are here to listen to you. So, you know, if you need a bit more time, there's no, you know, it's not, uh, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the floor, the floor is yours and thanks a lot for, for <laughs> So I share the screen for Marlon, uh, and so Marlon, uh, if you it is, you can go. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to present this collective book. And this book, uh, as Thomas has said, is the result of a conference we organized a year and a half ago at the University of Paris Dauphine. And it lasted two days and brought together more than 70 researchers from all over the world. And at the end of this colloquium, we decided to select some presentation to build the book around this question of uh, accumulation. So I will briefly introduce uh, you to the project of this book. Then Theo will present his theoretical framework and plan, and three authors will explain how they contributed to this project. So the idea for this colloquium and for this book came to us two years ago. And in conversation uh, with some researchers, we felt that we were looking at a situation somewhat beyond our comprehension. You could sum it up like this. Contemporary capitalism is putting more pressure on populations and natural resources, and natural resources than ever before. 
So living conditions are deteriorating for a large part of the world population. The natural environment is also deteriorating to the extent that we are looking increasingly seriously at a scenario whereby part of the planet will become uninhabitable very soon. And yet even capital accumulation shows no sign of letting up. It is actually accelerating even to the point that social collapse and environmental collapse ultimately appear to be profitable to the capitalist players. So the purpose of this book is to try to answer the question, how is that possible? How does the social fabric of capitalist accumulation work in the, 20, in the 21st century? So former sources of profits are, tra are transformed and new ones emerge. It seems that some actors use the social and environmental crisis to fuel new centers of capital accumulation. So identifying the mechanism of accumulation has become a crucial question for social sciences and for societies also that have been considerably uh, weakened by contemporary capitalism. So this book aims to describe the economic, technical, and political mechanism that explain the transformation of capital accumulation and dispossession centers. It investigates two main fields, the origin of profit in contemporary capitalism and the origins of the inequality produced by this form of accumulation. So uh, these are not new questions, of course. In recent years, uh, these issues have been the subject of uh, increasing attention in the social sciences. So using different scales of analysis, disciplines, and methods, the streams of research uh, all approach capitalism through the analysis of capital accumulation. This works emerged from several disciplines, including sociology, radical geography, and heterodox economics. Uh, some of them have received significant attention, such, of course, as uh, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, uh, David Harvey New Imperialism, Karen's All Liqui Liquidated, Francois Chenet Finance Capital Today, and uh, other book, um, I think, uh, of Jason Moore or Nancy Frader or other authors. So other less famous work um, are being developed in the US, in the UK, in France, or in Germany. And our book aims to make visible uh, this new generation of works that we think the political dimension of contemporary profit strategies and the institution that supports these strategies. So they, con they constitute a new interdisciplinary and materialist field of investigation by relating capitalist accumulation to the analysis and of the local transformation of labor, finance, and enrichment. And they define a new field of research that we uh, call accumulation studies. So open and under construction, this field gathers researchers that study the institutional and economic groundings of the new profit strategies in order to understand how capital is accumulated today. So Theo is okay. going to, to develop now the framework, uh, the theoretical framework of the of this book. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to develop very briefly the theoretical framework of, uh, of the contributions of the book and then uh, to present uh, briefly as well uh, each section. Uh, so the contribution, uh, contributions presented in this book uh, all revisit the, the Marxist uh, tradition uh, and I'm going to explain uh, how. Uh, the contributions uh, bring together the study of capital and the production of inequalities by taking the mechanisms of accumulation as a, a starting point. So they define uh, these mechanisms as both uh, economic and institutional processes. Uh, and so um, uh, a common point in all our contributions is that they focus on the issue of capital accumulation, but with a view towards uh, its institutional uh, aspects. Uh, so. Let me explain that. Uh, even if Marx provides a, a partial description of the state apparatus in his analysis of uh, Bonapartism, uh, there is no systematic theory of the state in his work. So this difficult point has led to uh, theoretical reconstructions of the role of the state uh, in accumulation. Uh, that's the case for Antonio Gramsci in the 20s and 30s, for Nikos Poulanzas uh, in the 60s and 70s, and more recently, of uh, John O'Connor on the fiscal crisis of the states, Giovanni Arrighi on the analysis of systemic crisis of accumulation, uh, and David Harvey on dispossessive policies. Uh, and so here uh, in this book, uh, accumulation is described by uh, our contributors as 
embedded into institutional arrangements uh, that are co-produced through time by public uh, and capitalist actors. And so second point uh, of uh, the theoretical framework of these uh, contributions, these, uh, these chapters broaden the Marxist definition of accumulation by giving a, a central role uh, to uh, the mechanisms of dispossession and commodification. Uh, so they build on uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, David Harvey. Uh, these authors show how the primitive accumulation described by Marx as a phase of uh, plundering, the original sin of capitalism uh, is not only the, the, the condition of its rise, but also of its perpetuation even today. Uh, so what David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession is actually consubstantial to the development of capitalism itself. And accumulation through dispossession has even been the dominant form of capitalism uh, since uh, the 70s. Uh, this has resulted, from instance, for instance, from the efforts of the former uh, communist states to integrate themselves into the, the capitalist system, from uh, the financialization of the economy, or from the, the political success of neoliberalism as a doctrine aiming to organize the self uh, disempowerment of the states. And so uh, the, the contributions uh, of this book allow for an understanding of the political, social, and uh, cultural conditions uh, of uh, this mechanism of uh, dispossession and, and commodification. Uh, and so I'm going now to quickly uh, introduce uh, the, the four parts of the book. I'm not going to develop all the contributions, but of course, uh, I invite you to read uh, the, the chapters. Uh, so uh, first section, uh, labor and nature. So historically, uh, exploitation of labor and nature uh, have been the main sources of uh, profit for capitalist actors. Uh, so this part of the book aims to reinterpret these two classical objects of social science. Uh, and so studying uh, the, the contemporary forms of labor exploitation, the contributions first ask, uh, what are the mechanisms through which workers with increasingly heterogeneous statuses uh, are linked to emerging centers of profit accumulation? And so we go through, for instance, the US case uh, with the chapter of uh, Gérard Duménil and Dominique Lévy that shows how a class of workers, managers, uh, finds itself in the position to exploit other workers and accumulate considerable fortunes. Uh, we go through Guillaume Vado's chapter that focuses on wage earning labor uh, in Cameroon's uh, large scale plantations, uh, where he shows that actually uh, uh, he, he tempers the opposition between exploitation and dispossession and shows that wage earning labor uh, in this context is actually a form of dispossession. Uh, then we talk about nature exploitation. Uh, we ask how is nature transformed into a source of profit in a world where natural resources are being depleted. So focusing on the relationship between nature and labor exploitation, Matthew Sonner's chapter outlines the debate between uh, growth, uh, green growth and degrowth and then uh, Mora Benet Jamo's uh, chapter deals with the relationship between agricultural labor, nature exploitation, the, and the dispossession of local populations uh, during the African Green Revolution. Uh, then, uh, in a second part, uh, the book develops the role of financial investment in accumulation. Uh, indeed, the, the financial sector has uh, become a, a crucial element in the uh, construction of inequalities and of large individual fortunes. Uh, so, studying uh, financialization. Uh, first raises the issue of its possible conditions. And so we ask uh, what are the institutional mechanisms involved in the accumulation of financial capital? Uh, and we see how these mechanisms uh, include the institutional work of lobbying groups, uh, such as the City of London Corporation, which is described in Matthew Eagleton Pierce's chapter. Uh, then in the chapter that uh, he's going to present us this evening, uh, Samuel Weeks, uh, shows uh, how states and the financial sector, in particular the Luxembourg uh, state, uh, co-produce the legal mechanisms enabling financial accumulation to take place. Uh, then we go on to uh, the, 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 the relationship between finance and the productive sphere. So we ask, uh, do the profit strategies of finance rely primarily on the intensification of labor exploitation, on dispossession, or on purely speculative strategies? Uh, and we will see that uh, in particular with uh, Fabien Fourreau's chapter. Fabien Fourreau is going to present his chapter uh, this evening uh, by studying uh, the leverage buyout uh, scheme. And, and finally, uh, Philippe Mader and Leslie uh, Sherat's uh, chapter uh, underlines uh, how the financialization of small companies in the global south has been enabled by the lobbying activity of large uh, philanthrocapitalist organizations uh, such as the Mastercard and Gates Foundation. Uh, then, uh, third part of the, of the book uh, 
uh, the book describes the emergence of digital technologies by adopting an alternative approach to, to science studies. Uh, these uh, free contributions show how these technologies create new centers of capital accumulation and transform existing ones. Uh, Moritz uh, Uten's chapter uh, shows the ambivalence of uh, cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain. Uh, then uh, Cédric Durand's chapter uh, studies the role of uh, intellectual property in algorithms in IT companies using Veblen, uh, Torstein Veblen, to underline how the new digital capitalism uh, relies essentially on a predation. And in a similar way, uh, Marc-André Gagnon's chapter underlines uh, the, the importance of ghost management practices in the pharmaceutical sector to appropriate public funding. Uh, and finally, last part of the book, uh, capital accumulation requires the transformation of profits into personal wealth uh, and the protection of these fortunes against uh, redistributive tendencies. And so here again, we ask, uh, what are the processes that protect uh, the capital accumulated by wealthy individuals? Uh, and so to answer this uh, question, uh, the last part of the book first quantifies and, and describes uh, the accumulation of individual fortunes. And so Anna Cusella and uh, Anu Cantela, uh, who are here uh, this evening, uh, contribute to the debate on the role of owners by using a, a really very uh, detailed database of the wealthiest Finnish individuals. And so we'll hear their presentation this evening. Then to protect capital, uh, wealthy people employ uh, wealth management and, and, and tax session professionals. And so the chapters of uh, Camille Erlangiret uh, investigates the role of these wealth managers in, in the French case. And then uh, Silke Hodge chapter studies tax managers in, in Germany and investigates their involvement in recent tax evasion scandals. And finally, in the closing chapter of the book, uh, Céline Bessière and Sibyl Golak study the gender of capital. They evidence uh, the structural sexism uh, of the mechanisms through which capital is distributed and appropriated, uh, for instance, through the legal devices involved in, in divorce and inheritance uh, that systematically disadvantage women in the distribution of wealth. Uh, so uh, that's it for the presentation of the book. And so to conclude, uh, this book uh, contributes to creating a, a research network on accumulation studies. Uh, it gathers researchers who attempt to understand the global evolution of uh, capitalism uh, and that use uh, empirical cases to map the contemporary uh, dynamics of, uh, of capital accumulation. So that's uh, the project we've tried to, to do in this book. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to let uh, our contributors uh, present their work. And uh, first uh, goes uh, Samuel Wicks on the Luxembourg Fund. Oh, yes, and I have to stop sharing my screen. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be joining you all today. My name is Samuel Weeks. I'm Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia in the United States. Before I start, however, I'd like to thank Theo and Marlene for all the work they have done organizing the June uh, 2019 conference at Paris Dauphine, as well as publishing the ensuing edited volume with Routledge. It has been an enormous pleasure to be a small part of this timely project. I'd also like to thank Thomas, Olivia, and Luca for inviting us to their laboratory to present our research on the thorny question of capital accumulation, which, at least in its financial form, has continued at a brisk pace in the last year, notwithstanding the disruptions, death, and impoverishment caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. To begin, in chapter 24 of Capital Volume 3, in which Marx famously likens the ability of money to create value to that of a pear tree to bear pears, he discusses the central role played by the accumulation of financial assets within the capitalist mode of production. This tendency, perceptively noted by Marx in the early 1860s, has since become a defining characteristic of contemporary capitalism best seen in the current proliferation of investment funds or administrative vehicles ensuring capital accumulation. This tendency, uh, in this paper, I examine the development of one of contemporary capitalism's most utilized administrative vehicles ensuring financial accumulation, the Luxembourg Investment Fund, in which uh, is housed at present a staggering 5 trillion US dollars in accumulated assets as seen here on the slide. 
This eye-popping figure makes tiny Luxembourg the world's largest, uh, the world's second leading domicile jurisdiction for accumulating uh, fund assets after the United States, a country that is 550 times more populous than this grand duchy. To aid my analysis, I draw inspiration from the approach of the regulation theorists, a group of mostly French political economists working within and alongside the Marxist and Durkheimian traditions from the 1970s onward. Uh, propelled by the seminal text of um, Aglietta and Chenet and others, including Louis Althusser, the so-called regulationists sought to explain one of capitalism's trickiest of paradoxes, how capitalist economies are able to preserve their processes of accumulation and reproduction amid all of the social contestation that arises from this mode of production. Hey, hey, hey. Um, it is in this historical and conceptual nexus in which I, set, uh, I situate my present analysis. Within later iterations of regulation theory uh, came to address the increasingly globalized and deregulated versions of finance capitalism taking shape in the 1980s and 90s, the classic scholarship from this tendency remained preoccupied with the conjuncture of the post-1968 period, years marked by growth deceleration, the fraying of the Fordist economic model, and the steel and oil crises in the global north. In this light, in order to analyze the Luxembourg Investment Fund as an exemplary vehicle of contemporary accumulation processes, it is necessary to expand on the impressive conceptual and historical apparatus that Aglietta and colleagues have left for us. To tell the full story of investment funds in Luxembourg, however, we must begin in the 1950s. During this time, key players in the country had begun to recognize the vast and untapped market for investment funds, a financial, in, uh, a financial instrument that traces its origins to 19th century Scotland, but which became popular in the United States in the 1920s. Because continental Europe long had a different tradition of finance capitalism than what existed in the Anglo-Saxon world, representatives from the fast growing investment companies came looking for a European domicile in which their products, funds largely consisting of US stocks and bonds would not be subject to tax by the US fiscal authorities. At the same time, driven by the increasingly integrated economic architecture of post-World War II Europe, key politicians in Luxembourg sought to attract large Euro-American finance related institutions into the country. The first step to this end was the, legislat the legislature's 1956 amendment to the infamous 1929 law on holdings, an act that allowed foreign fund management companies to begin operations in Luxembourg. The lightly taxed and notorious H29 holding company, a structure designed to bring together and avoid double or any taxation on the sprawling assets of large foreign financial groups would not work on its own as the administrative vehicle for an investment fund meaning that some legal entrepreneurialism would be necessary before the Luxembourg Fund could take off. Inspired by the US Mutual Fund, the British Unit Trust, and the franco suisse CCAV Collective Investment Scheme, a, a select group of local attorneys began to alter in piecemeal fashion the H29 holding company with the intention of creating a legal structure for funds whose investment domicile would be in Luxembourg. The driving force behind the growth of this market, however, was not a Luxembourger, but rather an American. In the 1960s, the colorful fund entrepreneur, Bernie Kornfeld, as shown in this slide with a friend, made a fortune selling mutual funds to the tens of thousands of US military personnel stationed in post-World War II Europe. Kornfeld's operation, the Luxembourg domiciled investors overseas services, sent thousands of salespeople door to door in various Euro European countries in an effort to convince small scale savers to place their money in funds marketed by the company. As Kornfeld's operation grew and grew over the course of the 1960s, increasing scrutiny from regulators and journalists eventually revealed widespread accounting mal malfeasance within the company's operations and a pyramid-like marketing structure. The eventual bankruptcy of investors overseas services was a traumatic experience for those working in the Luxembourg Financial Center at the time, given the firm's extensive usage of the country as a domicile for its funds. As was recalled by a number of my interviewees, 
the Cornfield debacle exposed the limits of ultra laissez-faire attitude held at the time um, by the country's finance and political elites. Some kind of new legal and regulatory structure for funds would be needed. By the mid 1970s, Kornfeld and his operation were finished, but it was obvious that capital accumulation via investment funds was here to stay. Rather than abandon the fund industry entirely, Luxembourg's finance and political elites redoubled their efforts and waited for more advantageous market conditions to present themselves. The right conjecture for investment funds turned out to be not far off. Against the backdrop of Europe's deepening market integration via the European economic community, a working group of Lux Luxembourgish politicians, regulators, and attorneys became charged with um, formulating a new le uh, legal framework for investment funds, a task that began in 1980 and was completed three years later. In this legislation, as we see in the slide, the group resolved to address the important issues of fund liquidity, asset diversification, and risk management. By the time this process had concluded, Luxembourg's fellow EEC member states, France and Italy, had ended their strict exchange controls uh, and resistance to the free circulation of financial products, such as investment funds, within the emerging single market then under construction in Western Europe. This new legal framework dating from 1983 marked the takeoff of the investment funds industry in Luxembourg. In March of 1998, uh, in March of 1988 rather, the Luxembourg government swiftly implemented the first EEC directive for investment funds, given the cumbersome, cumbersome name in English of uh, Undertakings for Collective Investment in Transferable Securities or USIPs. Being the first country to offer administrative services for these EEC wide funds, gave the Luxembourg Financial Center a decisive competitive edge in relation to other countries within the bloc, most notably Ireland. In the decades since, the rapid growth of Luxembourg's low margin yet high volume investment funds industry has followed the agglomeration effect theory formulated by Palan and colleagues. They write, quote, those governments that are able to provide modern infrastructure began to attract serious business into their territories. As additional banks and financial institutions enter the local market, competition uh, intensifies, raising the reputation of the center for efficiency and competitiveness. In time, agglomeration economies generate pockets of expertise and a tax haven develops a, repu uh, a reputation in certain specialized markets." Unquote. Uh, I conclude this chapter by reverting to the overall theme of the volume, capital accumulation. At the heart of the economic models found in Luxembourg and other offshore centers is a tension between two versions of accumulation, financial and productive. While officials in the Grand Duchy and comparable institutions undoubtedly prefer the former variety, the resulting financial accumulation uh, can never be divorced from the fates awaiting those producing goods and services globally. Nevertheless, the long-term trends seem to favor Luxembourg and its ilk. Since the 1980s, Regulationists such, such as Chenet and others have shown um, accumulation by a financial activity has outpaced all homologous processes predicated on industrial production. The imperatives of shareholder value privilege those who own assets, which has prompted a, uh, a decisive change in the priorities of managers vis-a-vis -vis the treatment of workers and research and development. While such changes have resulted in vast capital accumulation within financial products such as Luxembourg investment funds, their growth on uh, their effect on overall economic growth has nonetheless been negative throughout much of the global north. Can the activities of the Luxembourg financial centers of the world continue to both depress aggregate growth and enrich on the owners of capital? Perhaps. In the current conjuncture in which securities capitalism and shareholder value have become omnipresent and hegemonic, tout va bien for the Grand Duchy's investment funds industry, as we see in the slide. Due to the fragmented and increasingly specialized markets for USITs and other financial products, the Luxembourg funds administration sector has repeatedly shown that it can handle both uh, volume in terms of the trillions of US dollars under its purview and specialization as seen in the sheer variety of fund type investment strategies and legal structures on offer. In this light, we might conclude 
that Luxembourg's fund administrators will undoubtedly be on hand to shape the next phase of worldwide finance capitalism, complete with both the promise and misery it will no doubt engender. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, now Samuel is gonna is gonna follow. Fabien, Fabien, I think. Fabien Fou. Uh, sorry, Fabien. Yep, I'm going to share my screen. Great. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, we don't see it. Uh... Yeah, it's back. Back? Oh, yeah. We see it. Sorry. Excuse me. So, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, today. I'm very pleased to present this uh, work in front of you. Um, I'm going to deal with uh, what's called leverage buyout operations. Um, and especially I'm going to deal with uh, financial accumulation and its relationships with exploitation through these uh, leverage buyout operations. So the argument of the chapter is to discuss the notion of accumulation by dispossession by uh, David Harvey, who says that uh, in today's capitalism, in today's financial capitalism, accumulation takes place more and more through uh, a channel called dispossession and less and less through the channel, the classical channel of uh, labor exploitation. And I'm discussing this theory um, through a case study, a case study of uh, private equity firms, which are a type of investors, uh, that carry out leverage buyout operations or also called LBOs, and I'm going to explain what it is. I base myself on a literature review in economics and management, and also on my own work, which is a sociological work about LBOs in France. And um, uh, this work was published as a book uh, last year called Le Capital en Action, if you want to check it out. And um, what I'm arguing in this chapter is that if, we, if you take what I call an organizational view, um, you can see that exploitation is not only uh, taking place at the individual level, so exploitation of labor, but exploitation can also happen at the, at the collective level so that corporations can be exploited as a whole, as is in this, in this case of leverage buyout operations. And I'm also arguing that um, in the framework of David Harvey, what he calls dispossession, which means here taking resources out of the company, dispossession can also facilitate exploitation so that there is not a strict opposition between labor exploitation on one hand and dispossession on the other hand. The two are articulated in these uh, leverage buyout op operations. But I also show that this dispossession facilitates exploitation, but also hinders cooperation so that uh, there is a contradiction and uh, these uh, leveraged buyout operations are, are not very uh, sustainable. So what are leveraged buyout operations? Leverage, a leverage buyout is a um, takeover, an acquisition technique uh, with debt. We, we can talk about leverage buyouts when a private equity firms or type of investor, investment fund, takes the control of a company, then try to restructure the company to improve its performance and sell its capital after one, five years uh, later. Here you have um, the, a target company, usually a middle-sized firm, which has a shareholder. The buying shareholder is a private equity firm, buys the capital of the target company, with a legal device a holding company here called the Nuco. And he pays the, the price by putting around like five, 50% uh, equity and 75% debt. And this use of debt in these operations is what makes leverage bad operations so special. Because debt 
uh, not only increase buying capacity for the private equity firm, but and uh, magnify returns through the leverage effect. But the uh, debt is also a political tool. It's a political tool, according to um, agency, agency theorist Michael Jensen, it's a political tool to reorganize and restructure the, the company. Michael Jensen says in 1989, debt is in effect a substitute for dividends, a mechanism to force managers to disgorge cash rather than spend it on empire, empire building projects with low or negative returns, bloated staffs, in dungeon percocytes and organizational inefficiencies. So these leverage, leverage buyout operations uh, are operating according to uh, the discipline of debt and uh, a shock therapy on the company in order to disgorge cash and, um, and uh, improve the operational performance of the company. And basically get by getting uh, rid of the bureau of bureaucracy inside the corporation. Um, so my, my view on this is that um, LBOs are, are actually uh, what I call a self-limited exploitation mechanism. And if we, take, uh, if we take the organizational view that I'm arguing for, uh, we can see that it's, it's indeed an exploitation mechanism and that dispossession is, uh, facilitates this exploitation. What I call the organizational view is the view that takes as a unit of analysis the firm as a political coalition, and that uh, takes into account the fact that the source of value, economic value, is cooperation within the firm. And the main evidence I find for this, uh, this, this view, this uh, view of uh, LBOs as, as uh, exploitation mechanism, is that when you, see, when you look at the literature, you see that uh, these LBOs have a considerable impact on the op op occupational and organizational structure of the firm. It's not purely speculative. It's, uh, the private equity firm not only, not only surf on the value of companies, but tries to restructure the company in order to create more value. And the second evidence I find for this, uh, for this organizational view is the fact that you the, the LBOs lead to a simultaneous pressure high on productivity in the corporations and down on wages. And these two simultaneous pressures I take as a rough indicator of the increase in the rate of exploitation. But it's an exploitation mechanism, but it's also a self-limited exploitation mechanism. It's, it's self-limited it's, uh, self because the, these LBOs work like uh, a pumping machine, like pumping resource, resources out of the companies until there is no, nothing left to, to pump. And so that's why, according to me, they are not very sustainable. And that is why we see a decline actually in, in performance of these private equity uh, funds. I, I uh, give some evidence. There is actually contra contradictory results uh, in the literature about this, but a lot of uh, studies of private e equity funds performance find declining returns. Uh, I provide some evidence in the chapter. Here is a new evidence that I found recently. Uh, they take uh, as a measure of fund performance, a specific measure, but um, I won't go into the details. And we see that uh, as LBOs, and private equity strategies developed uh, on a bigger and bigger scale, the returns to these operations have been declining all over. So, so my chapter basically um, takes the, uh, the perspective of David Harvey, interrogates his, uh, his theory. And uh, I think the conclusion that we can draw uh, from these leverage buyout operations is that uh, accumulation can take place uh, both as exploitation and dispossession at the same time. Thank you very much. And so now uh, I think that uh, Anna Cusela and Anu Cantola are going to, to present uh, their chapter. Will you say a few words or? 
No, I just say hello and I'll be, I, I, I've been leading the project, but Hannah has been the first writer in this paper. So, so we thought it's, it's more convenient that uh, Hannah gives the talk. Okay, can you now see the slides and hear me? Yes, everything is good, yeah. Okay, right. Um, so um, our topic or my topic is, is Finland and the top earners, the 0.1% zero, uh, 0 of top earners in Finland and the role of capital income in, in, in creating this group. Um, as you might know, or you, you, Finland is quite famous for actively taming inequalities and economic inequalities, uh, income inequalities, but also we have witnessed the, the phenomenon where the top groups have are taking kind of increasingly bigger shares of, of the economic growth. And so it's the rich are getting richer also in Finland, although in, in many ways we are still one of the most equal countries in, in the world. So like I said, um, our topic is the top earners uh, and the role of capital income in creating these top earners or the group of top earners in Finland. Um, and it's the chapter is part of a larger research project we did with Anu. Uh, among this group, and it's, it's mostly a qualitative research project uh, among the top earners, and we did 90 interviews among these people, um, interviewed them about their views on social issues, welfare, state, work, and inequality regimes in Finland. But then we also collected some descriptive statistics on the group. And if I would say sort of very quickly what the main results are in the, in the entire research uh, project we did, so in the interviews, the people, uh, these top earners sort of stressed very, very much uh, hard work and diligence and meritocracy. But when we look at the descriptive statistics, it, it's actually capital income, which is by far the main source of income for these, these top earners. So there is kind of a discrepancy between the idea of meritocracy and hard work and then the reality where it's actually capital income that, that creates this group. And in the, the statistics also show that, show that the distribution is heavily skewed also inside this top group, also inside these top earners. And the higher in the scale of these top earners you are, the more important capital income is. So capital income accumulates even inside of this uh, top earning group in Finland. So who are the top earners then in Finland? Well, are they working rich or rentiers? Uh, we are lucky enough in Finland to have totally public tax records, even on the level of individuals. So our project is based on this kind of public tax records. And we started by taking the 10 year income, gross income tax data. Um, and then we took the list of 5,000 people, which consists of 0.1% of, of Finnish earners. And then we also use the income distribution statistics. And then, then we did kind of a qualitative categorization of these 5,000 people uh, in order to, uh, to kind of categorize their main sources of income or wealth or what we thought was their main source of income. And here you can see the breakdown um, of this group where, we, where you can see that the big groups are managers, inheritors, entrepreneurs, and then a kind of a, a group of different kind of professionals like lawyers and doctors. And then there are there is a group of unknown people, but that's basically because they have such a common names that we couldn't identify these people. And then our research focused uh, more clearly on three groups, which we thought were kind of distinctive, uh, but also but still very important inside this uh, these larger groups. And these were inheritors who had inherited some family fortunes, or and then entrepreneurs, and then managers. And then if we look at the role of capital income in, in creating this group or inside the group. So we can see quite clearly that capital income accumulates strongly at the top. And if we look at the figures, these charts of distribution of, of this group, so it's basically capital income um, that uh, that's, uh, is the most important source of income. And the higher you get on the scale, uh, the more significant capital income is. So for the group, the entire group of 0.1%, uh, it was 60%, uh, a bit more than 60% of their gross income was capital income. But if we, if you take the 0.01, it's already 80%. Or if you take the 0.001, 0 
percent, so it's 90 percent, almost all of their income comes from capital. And if you compare this to the population uh, in large or the average population, so Finns get around 10 percent of their income from capital income. So there is, of course, a huge difference between the, the top that gets 90 percent and, and the Finns in average. And then the distribution is also heavily skewed inside this, uh, this group, this group of top earners. So that the mean uh, is, uh, was significantly higher than the median inside this group. And so it was more so than uh, in, in the case of the capital income uh, than in the case of total gross income of this group. And then if you look at, because our, um, our data uh, finished it at 2016, but if you look at the most recent developments, which there is this um, one arrow. So actually, I, I, I just uh, looked what, what has happened after this 2016. And if you add the, the last three years or the next three years, so it's already almost a double. The, the person on the first, uh, the person on the top is now has almost doubled the, uh, the scale uh, in just the three years. So, so the, basically the, the development is getting, uh, it, it's getting harder all the time. So, and if you look at the, uh, the three distinct groups we then um, studied in the, um, in the project, so we can see that it's basically the inheritors and the entrepreneurs who are at the very top inside the top earners. And it is basically due to the amount of capital income that they receive. So the capital income is the main source of income, it's 90% for the inheritors and the entrepreneurs compared to the managers who only, only receive 12% of their income in, uh, in capital income. And also here you can see that, or you can't see, what, but the, we tell it in the chapter, the difference between the mean and the median is again large. So that, for example, uh, in the case of the hairs, it's 70% higher uh, and in the case of the entrepreneurs, it's 90% higher, uh, the mean than the uh, median. And for the hairs, so the incomes of the top 1% of the hairs uh, in the group was tenfold in relation to the 99% of the hairs. And as you can see, the managers clearly deviate from the other two groups. They, they get most of their income uh, as earned income, and they also uh, earn much less than almost half of that of the entrepreneurs and, and heirs. So whichever way you look at the kind of the group, it's, it's basically capital income that takes them to the top. And unfortunately, this then has severe consequences for, for the taxation of the, this group, which means that at the very top, the Finnish tax system is at the moment regressive. So because the average effective tax rates of this group that we studied uh, remains at 34, compared with the highest effective tax rate of 55 in Finland. And this is basically due to the, the role of capital income, because in Finland, it's basically a flat tax, or there are only two categories, 30 and 34, for the capital income. And our colleagues, the economists, Rihla and Tuomala, have also shown that basically it's, it has been the case the entire 21st century that, that the top 0.1 groups, the tax rate of the 0 0.1 remains uh, lower than the tax rate of the top one, and even of the fractal from 90 to 99. So actually, or uh, in the end, so the case is that the ownership or the ability to transform earned income into capital income, because that's the case with some of the uh, entrepreneurs, for example, is that, that this ownership itself is a substantial means to lower the tax rate inside the country and inside the national tax system. And remember, or it's, it's good to know that I'm only talking about official tax, uh, tax income. So offshore income is, is not included in any way in this. So the larger frame um, in the chapter or the kind of the larger question or the larger issue we want to raise in the, um, in the chapter through this data, through these uh, statistics, is that we should kind of focus much more on ownership and, and the cultures around ownership to understand the contemporary uh, processes of accumulation and, and contemporary inequality, inequality regimes. So basically, I think our data illuminates 
further this kind of the position of the owner who can accumulate both income and wealth by the virtue of, of his or her ownership. And I think Branko Milanovic has recently uh, written of Homo Plutia, so basically a, a bit of the same issue. So, so I'd, our idea is that to understand this kind of dynamics of accumulation, the role of ownership and owners needs more attention maybe in research next to those of managers and different kind of financial and economic uh, immediate risks and institutional investors and institutions. And maybe it also means uh, kind of doing research on the collective or individual agency of, of these owners, whether they are dynastic families or entrepreneurs after successful exits or, or things like that. So that we should study also the cultural frames that sustain these privileges and, and the kind of social and political regimes that account for these advantages that are, that are obviously there. And, and whether these, they, these owners themselves kind of uh, are active in normalizing their position and lobbying for their interest in legitimizing the scale effect stage enjoy. And that's, that would be the kind of the part, the qualitative part of our research project that we have been doing. So basically the kind of the puzzling question that around which we have, um, have organized our chapter in the book is this question that how, how is it possible actually that the current system benefits the owners on such a large scale. How is it possible culturally? Because the data shows it quite obviously. But thanks. This was what I wanted to say. OK, so are we, are we done with the presentation you wanted to make? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay. That's all. I mean, that's all for for the contributors that are here uh, this evening. So, I think uh, that's already a big of a good overview of the of the book. Yes. Uh, so, Olivia, shall I, uh, so maybe I'm gonna ask a few questions, and then Olivia, you tell us about the chat and uh, yes. Other so. So thanks a lot for all this presentation. I, you know, I thought this was really great. This gave us a very good overview of the diversity of approaches that you have been able to put together in this book. You know, it's very impressive to see, uh, you know, both quantitative, qualitative approaches, institutional work, work focusing on the actors uh, uh, in the in the Luxembourg mutual fund industry, or, or, or you know, there are other chapters of, in the book focusing on wealth managers. So yeah, it, so that we really have this combination of approaches, which I thought. Uh, came um, came out very well in the in the book so let me start with uh, maybe just two or three questions so that we have time for uh, for other questions just, you know, one one question for the author the only my only big regret about the book is the price of the book and i already told you by email but you know, it's incredible that you write a book on dispossessive policies and you ended up with a book that Routledge is selling 120 euros or something so i know that the uh, 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 electronic digital copy is much less expensive, like 20 or 25, which makes a big difference. But still, how did you end up being dispossessed this way? And, you know, it's not completely anecdotal, and I'd be happy to know the answer. And I also noticed that in the chat, there was a question, is this book going to come out in French? And I mean, I know English is a very important language, of course, but I think it's a you know, I, I think there's also a public in French which potentially is interested, but I'm, I'm sure it's not so simple. And but maybe there's a way to put it to have an online version. I, you know, I don't know, but of course the translation itself I know is very costly. So anyway, that was really a small aside. Let, let me ask two more um, uh, uh, substantial questions. One for Samuel Weeks, which I so I, Samuel, I, I really enjoyed a lot your presentation, and it, it makes me wonder. You, you know, of course, this book by, uh, by Rawi Abdelal, uh, Capital Rules, where, you know, uh, uh, so Rawi, uh, which is this, you know, this book, Capital Rules by Rawi Abdelal, which was published in 2007, where Rawi looks at the, uh, you know, the development of free capital flow uh, treaties in Europe in the 1980s, 1990s, you know, without any fiscal cooperation, without any automatic exchange of information. And he puts a lot of weight, uh, a lot of responsibilities, on, in particular on the French uh, socialists, uh, uh, you know, who, who negotiated the, the 
uh, Maastricht uh, Treaty and the agreement and, and, and free capital flows with, uh, with Germany and other European partners. And now, of course, the perspective you offer is a bit different because you go back through time and you show how you know, there were people around the Luxembourg fund industry which were sort of lobbying for a much longer time about going in this direction. But I guess, so my question is, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, so do you have a view on some, somehow on the, the, you know, the different responsibilities? So, I mean, you have the lobbying group uh, within the, the financial industry, and you know, then you have the politicians who, in, when, in the case of France, who are looking for a new uh, sort of political, uh, political agenda in the mid 1980s, late 1980s, and went for this, uh, went for the single currency and, and free capital flows, and, and uh, did not necessarily look at the long run consequences of what they were doing or where they, what was the role of lobbyists? And so what's the interaction basically between the Abdelal story somehow uh, focusing a lot on politicians, you know, and, uh, Jacques Delors, uh, Pascal Lamy, you know, all these French socialists who are really the villains of the story of Abdelal and, and your story where the villains are all these financial uh, uh, lobbyists and, and which you have told. Uh, so that's, that's, that would be my question. And, I have a, a second question, so let, let me ask it uh, now uh, so that I'm done with uh, for, uh, for Anna and Anu, which is, uh, so about Finland, so you, 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 you did not tell us about the, the qualitative part of the, of the research, which, you know, uh, if we have time, you might be very happy to learn to know more about this. And I had a question more about the quantitative part, which is, so you, you argue that uh, the, 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 the tax system in Finland sort of became very regressive at the top following the, the dual uh, feature with a lower tax rate for capital income. Now, this, this has not always been like that. So, and so you've shown us data on, on top income. So do we have evidence on the consequences for wealth inequality and for the rising concentration of wealth at the top, which in principle, uh, you know, with, with this regressive uh, income tax feature at the top should allow people at, at the top to accumulate more and to increase wealth concentration. So do we have evidence on this in Finland? And, and, and more generally, how does this Finnish case compare to uh, the neighbor, neighboring countries, uh, uh, you know, so Sweden, Norway, and, and, and this world? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I should stop there. I had another question also for Fabian, but maybe we are going to take, you know, maybe you can uh, answer, and then we'll see with Olivia other questions, and I don't know, we'll see, we'll see later. Uh, so first about the price of the book. What happened? How did you get this process this way? You want to go, Marlon? Or how do I go? I go. Uh, so I, I think uh, actually um, uh, we, we tried uh, several things. I mean, we tried the publishers. I mean, I, that's true that uh, Routledge has a quite, um, I mean, it targets uh, big universities, uh, international universities with a lot of money and libraries. And so it's really not a democratic uh, publishing model. I think we, we tried. Um, uh, publishers with a, a more democratic uh, publishing model, but uh, we ended up with a Routledge, which is a, still that's quite a good uh, editing work. But we wanted also the open access, but uh, uh, Routledge uh, makes uh, the authors pay for the open access, so uh, it was quite complicated. And then uh, there are very good publishers like uh, Open Access Publishing or Zone Sensible or other publishers like this that do uh, open access or less expensive. Um, books, but uh, uh, I think there are, I mean, there were other issues uh, such as uh, having a book in a, an acknowledged publisher, for instance, myself, and I think it would require an analysis also of the, of the logics of academics, but for, for myself, for instance, I'm, uh, I don't have a, a tenure track position or I, I'm a postdoc, so for instance, uh, I needed also uh, that the book be published in the, in the best, um, most acknowledged uh, publisher possible. And I think many authors have the same kind of um, needs. So I think in the end, that's how we end up with um, a book uh, at a very um, possessive uh, price. I don't know if <laughs> Marlene wants to, to add anything. Okay, no, that's, that's fair enough, yes. Um, uh, yes, I'm um, Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas, for your question. Um, I would answer it in um, in the sense of a longer trajectory whereby 
what was once offshore finance becomes onshore finance. Um, there's quite a good example in the US whereby in the early 60s, Kennedy was already starting to become worried about the budding Euro market that was flourishing worldwide. Um, yet every attempt to kind of tax the profits of the overseas profits of US companies just meant that more money was being held offshore in places like the city of London. So I think it was at the very end of the Reagan presidency, a lot of those um, taxes that, that viewed the Euro market negatively were reduced. And then a lot of business in the Euro market was transferred then to US territory. Um, so you see again, the offshore, um, the offshore or what was once offshore finance just becomes regular finance. And I think you can see that also clearly in the case of the Luxembourg Investment Fund, whereby Luxembourg had this market in which um, the so-called Belgian dentists would go to Luxembourg and do their business and then return to Brussels or to Germany or to France or wherever. Um, but with the EEC directives and the single market, you have a very advantageous for uh, advantageous situation for Luxembourg, whereby its domestic model for investment funds all of a sudden becomes, well, at the time it was a 15 country block, and then it was a 28 country block, and now it's a 27 country block. So it's essentially an expansion of its interior market to the single market more generally. And um, again, that's, I think, been the motor behind at least th this uh, niche within the Luxembourg Financial Center. So that's how I begin to address your, your very good question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the question. I might start. So, so the regressive tax system in Finland was born in the 1990s when the, the taxation on capital income was separated from, from the taxation for earned income. And after that, uh, the top group started to transform their uh, income into capital income. So we don't, with Anu, we don't work with time series, but our colleagues who have kind of larger time series, they show that it's actually, that then happens also this change from uh, that this um, that the people start to transform those who have the ability and of course the ability doesn't exist for everyone but only for the top groups so they start to transform their uh, income into lower taxed uh, capital income um, as far as wealth is concerned um, the wealth tax was abolished in 2006 so after that we don't have very good statistics on that of course there are all kind of uh, surveys but as we know the top groups are not very well presented in this kind of household service. So, so we don't know very much what has happened, but that's exactly why we wanted to look really carefully on this capital income and the role of capital income and taxation of this group, because that should reflect, of course, what has happened also what has happened for wealth uh, accumulation and wealth creation in Finland in general. Um, and then um, in relation to other countries, uh, of course, other, the researcher from those countries would be better to answer, but I do know that there is lots of uh, lots of research now, both in Sweden and Norway, on this kind of similar phenomenon. That in the Nordic countries there seems to be quite high social mobility among the population at large and pretty low income equalities, but it exists together with this with, with this kind of uh, accumulation at the top or that dynastic wealth accumulation and, and um, cross-generational uh, wealth creation. So that they, there seems to be kind of a new Nordic model or whether it's new or old, I, I'm not sure, but, uh, but maybe the story we tell about the Nordic model is not entirely, hasn't been entirely true because there exists both the social mobility and economic inequality for the population at large, but then there is increasingly these groups that actually stay rich for generations and accumulate more and more. And like I showed that only three years already makes a difference that this, this kind of capital income is doubled for the top uh, in Finland. But maybe Arno has something uh, more. Well, actually I'm happy with that. Uh, just mentioning the qualitative study, uh, 
because I've been thinking it would be really interesting to have a sort of comparative work on qualitative studies. So the uh, results generally were quite striking when we in, uh, interviewed 90 of these wealthiest people. And um, they have their own cultures, the inheritors, uh, the uh, CEOs, and, and uh, also the entrepreneurs. And politically, it was really like hot stuff <laughs> in, in Finland because they were so critical of the Nordic welfare state and sort of uh, taking off from the uh, solidaric system we've had uh, since the Second World War. So uh, in that sense, anyone interested in doing similar kind of a study would be really, really interesting. And it was actually quite simple to do uh, because we just interviewed the people and asked them to tell what they really think anonymously, and they really did. So, so it, uh, I think the results were really quite interesting. There's uh, some papers in sociology we published and also in, in sociological review. So uh, you can look up if you like. Thank you. Uh, so okay. Olivia, shall we move to Sure. Yeah. So we received questions in the chat and per email. So um, I start with the first one. Do you explore potential solutions in the book? Uh, maybe how to reshape institutions or forms of regulation to try to prevent this form of capital accumulation and increasing inequalities? Um. Actually, uh, no, I, not, not that I know. The, the book actually really focuses on on the on the mechanisms of uh, accumulation itself, and so we don't really. And that's something um, we could have done, and we've not done it already in the conference, and we've we've not done it in the book. But we don't really open on on social movements or, or resistances. Uh, we really focus on um, on capital accumulation processes. Even in, in some chapters, you can hear about. Uh, resistances in, in, I remember Guillaume Vado's chapter or, or Nora Benedjamo and, and other chapters, you, you can think, uh, read about resistances, but uh, it's not the, the main focus of the book. We really focus on the mechanisms of uh, accumulation. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a second question. Any views on the accumulation of immaterial capital, um, such as um, Brevet? Sorry, the patents. Yeah, patents. And the role it plays in the development of inequalities? Uh, yes, clearly. I think uh, there are several chapters. Uh, so, Marlene, complete me if you want, but uh, there are several chapters that deal about that, in particular, the, the two chapters uh, in, in the digital technologies um, part, uh, the chapter by uh, Cédric Durand that deals with uh, actually intellectual property with respect to algorithms in. in uh, uh, IT uh, sector, and so he, he he deals with that a lot, and he uses a, a conceptual framework that uh, I mean he uh, confronts uh, Marxism with a Marxist approach with the approach of uh, Torstein Veblen that uh, makes a theory around uh, the concept of uh, predation, and so he develops that. And Marc Andre Gagnon, in his uh, uh, chapter on the, the pharmaceutical sector, also talks. Uh, about uh, patent and, and predatory patent practices. So uh, that's the topic that, that, that is, uh, I mean, that's several uh, contributions talk in the book. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, one person is asking if uh, in some chapters, the book addresses a question of places where financial actors, uh, especially speculative finance encounters economic actors. Maybe I can leave it to, to Fabien. I don't know, but uh, I think uh, I don't know. But for me, sure. precisely, this, this question relates to, to Fabien's work, who studies okay. this. I don't know, Fabien, if you want to add something. Yeah. Can you repeat it? And I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, so, does the book address the question of uh, places where financial actors, and especially speculative finance, encounters economic actors? So, rather, the production sector. Yep. So my chapter deals precisely with this topic, since it studies the, um, the private equity firms, which are a type of uh, financial investor that are close to uh, hedge funds sometimes, close to investment banks some other times. And, uh, and their, their role is to, uh, is to uh, 
buy up uh, com companies and then sell the cap capital of the companies. And uh, so there are in close interactions with uh, the companies and especially the management of the companies. And so the, my chapter deals mainly with this, with this interaction between the productive sphere and the, uh, and the financial sphere with the theory behind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, exploitation and, uh, and, um, and uh, dispossession. Uh, maybe uh, just, uh, to follow up on this, Fabien, uh, one yep. question about your chapter and your presentation. The, yep. uh, so you show that LBO lead to a big uh, pressure on wages and downward pressure on wages. But from a quantitative viewpoint, can we say more about like what will be so how big it is, or like what will be the, the contribution of LBO? I don't know to the reduction in the labor share in. Uh, in the US or in, in, in France or in other countries. I mean, is there a way to sort of give a sense of how, how, how big this is as compared to the global sort of evolution of labor and profit shares or is it impossible really to say? Yeah, in order to know that, we have to know the, the relative importance of private equity within, uh, within, uh, within the economy. And uh, it's actually not uh, so easy to, uh, to know. Uh, with Marlene, we tried to, to do it a little bit. But, based, but when, when LBOs were, were um, very fashionable, it represented something like one quarter of all merger and acquisitions. So, uh, and mergers and acquisitions, acquisitions were, I think, a big part of the, um, of the corporate investment uh, in these times and still today. So, so, um, so I think if we try to uh, if we try to to show what are the contributions of this downward pressure on wages in the economy globally, we have to take into account this this fact. But uh, I would say actually I I, um, I came across a paper, an economics paper, showing that uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions have the same effect of these LBOs, meaning downward downward pressures on wages. Thank you. Um, I have another question for Hannah. Is the gross income you mentioned cash money or does it include equity? Mm, well, it is the taxed income, uh, not to the wealth, but it's, it's, the, yeah, it's the officially taxed income from capital, meaning like dividends and rental income to a certain extent, uh, the, the income received from selling your company or so. So if I understand the question right, so no, it's not eco, it, it is kind of cash money. So, but it, it is those incomes that are, um, that are taxed uh, and, and that, it's, that is the income that comes to the, to the individual, not the ones he owns. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you think, uh, and that's a question to all of you panelists, so, Feel free to answer. What do you think of William Lazanik's works, predatory value extraction, that seem to be very relevant without referring back to Marx? Well, so from, um, and again, I let uh, Marlene uh, reply if, uh, later, she wants to reply, but for, for, for the perspective of, uh, of the book as a whole, I think, uh, I, I don't know um, the, the, the book of uh, William Lazanik that came out uh, recently on predatory value extraction, but I know quite well the, his work on on uh, maximizing shareholder value and and, and this movement. Uh, and so I think uh, he opposes uh, value creation and, and value extraction. And I think that's something uh, that obviously to to us or to me at least it seems to be a kind of um, an application of of the concept of uh, dispossession to corporate policies, an extension of this concept to corporate policies. And that's uh, quite fair. I mean, if you think about uh, financialization, about the LBO uh, case that um, Fabien talked about, um, there is this big conflict between uh, exploitation and, and, and dispossession and, and the two logics actually uh, conjugate themselves. So I think that's a, a concept that is relevant. And, and to me, uh, 
I mean, the, the, the person who wrote the question says without referring back to Marx, but to me, you can really uh, integrate it uh, in a Marxist framework, even if I've not read this particular book of William Lesnick, but uh, in my opinion, uh, yeah, it, we, I mean, it, it, we, we agree with uh, the, the idea that uh, is behind uh, in William Lesnick's work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question, what's your take on the emerging financial market players, including more fund houses, family offices, and so on? I don't know. If, yeah, no. yeah, I could say something on that because we also interviewed these inheritors um, and I have a paper on, on, on those interviews where I do um, argue that there is actually a process of class making taking place uh, among today's inheritors. And I think they're exactly the kind of family, house, uh, family offices, uh, wealth managers. And I think there is one chapter on wealth managers also in, in this book. Um, so they are, there is an increasing kind of institutionalization and professionalization of these accumulation processes. And I think family offices and and wealth managers are, are a very important part of this because as we know in general, so inheritances are growing and, and it is getting kind of serious how, how this process is facilitated. So I, I think they, they definitely deserve a lot of attention. Just, just to I, add to I that. May... Sorry, go, go ahead, Anu. No, I, I just thought to add that one perspective with these heirs, uh, uh, the f old families who own a lot of money, is that there's also a problem of lazy capital. So uh, uh, risky businesses, uh, at least in Finland, they face sort of a uh, valley of death. They don't have uh, capital, risky capital at their disposal when you go uh, until, let's say, 50 million uh, euros. And, and that's become a sort of a problem. So uh, uh, capital these days, I don't know how it goes together with LBOs, <laughs> but uh, uh, lots of the capital has been inherited and they don't want to lose it. So they don't want to risk anything and they just want to be uh, sure that everything is saved. Uh, and, and the other parts of the capital are in the pension funds. So um, I don't. I think this is sort of a more European problem as well, uh, and might have to do something with the low rate of productivity as well. Uh, but I don't know if you've been looking into this side of capital. Um, Thank you. Just, um, I, I just wanted to uh, address this question of family offices. Um, so family offices are a relatively new phenomenon in Luxembourg. But Luxembourg, or at least the financial lobbies have recognized this as a growth segment for the larger financial center. Um, and uh, family offices are absolutely fascinating and include many different pieces, um, including like family banks, uh, you know, specialized family insurance policies, um, how family members can take out loans from the family office at very low interest rates or no interest rates. Uh, and then also there's a whole logistical apparatus attached to many family offices, um, you know, whereby the, the child's uh, private school fees are paid for and transport is coordinated. And like the, um, you know, the transport of artworks from uh, galleries and uh, museums and whatnot. Um, so it's really an interesting emerging part of this landscape. And Luxembourg long had something called the, the Fondation Patrimoniale, but that's been replaced by a new sort of updated family office um, infrastructure, including with a piece to bring these families into Luxembourg domestically, um, which has all kinds of effects on the local real estate market. But once these families are living in Luxembourg domestically, they can take part in domestic um, banking secrecy. Uh, so there's been some interesting movement in those regards, um, specifically uh, in Luxembourg. Yeah, and, and a last word on this question of uh, emerging financial market players that um, 
I think uh, it, we have not explored that in, in this book, but uh, along with Marlene, uh, we have tried to, to study precisely the, the different phases of financialization and what they mean in terms of the economic interests of each actors. Because if you look at the history of um, European countries like the UK or France, for instance, France in the 90s was already a financialized country. And now it's, it's uh, still a financialized country, but by other actors and in another way. And actually, along with Marlene, in our book on uh, authoritarian finance, we try to explore this uh, idea of successive phases of financialization and what are the, the, the economic interests of each of these uh, financial actors. Uh, and so we try to identify, the, in particular, the political interests of the actors of uh, second financialization that uh, had its uh, golden age in the, in the 2000s. Uh, so that's something we, we are keen to explore as well. Sorry, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, in your opinion, is there any difference between extractivist approaches to capitalism and Harvey concept of dispossession? So, uh, yeah, so the question, if there is any difference between extractivist approaches to capitalism and Harvey concept of dispossession, um, that's a good question. I don't know if someone wants to, to, uh, to answer. Actually, I don't know very well the extractivist approaches to capitalism. So uh, I'm afraid, uh, um, I guess it, it looks the same, but I don't know the, the authors behind the extractivist approaches. So I cannot uh, answer personally this question, but if anyone wants to, Okay. Um, oh, I don't know the author of the question is online or I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see if she's still online. Um, no. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. No. yes. So, so we can go, uh, go on and switch to the next question as well. Um, what potential uh, consequences do you see for LBOs and uh, uh, aim and a merging and acquisition accumulation for social good? Accumulation for social good? Yeah. So so this means that LBOs and MNAs would accumulate wealth for social good? Uh, yes, so I can Maybe, elaborate because- they, Okay, so these operations are accumulate waste wealth for private individuals. Then if the private individuals use their money for social good, then maybe, but uh, not, a, not necessarily. So they accumulate wealth for private ends, not for necessarily for social good, yes, I, I would say so. I think the author of the question had yep. something, you know, the, the yeah, firm she, KK, yeah. Yeah. she added an example. So, for example, the firm KKR famously partnered with the Natural Resources Defense Council in the U.S. to acquire and close stranded coal plant assets in Texas, justified as carbon reduction, with at best greenwashed and unclear results. So I think that's what uh, the participant was referring to. So if I understand well, uh, it would be more uh, okay. the marginal effects rather than. Okay, it would be no. It would be like uh, the private equity firms that have um, um, strategies relating to um, corporate social responsibility or something like uh, mm -hmm. responsible investments. I would. Um, Maybe maybe they have uh, they have these uh, these uh, responsible investments, but it's not their main goal. They are not specialized in these uh, these types of investments. And their okay. goal is to act is to actually get a, a a very very good return on on their investments, something like twenty five percent or something like that. Thank you. And we also have a participant who is asking about Africa. So um, um, do you know how like accumulation of capital uh, by dispossession is going on in Africa? And how is it, 
Well, is it possible that a similar work can be done in at least the biggest uh, economies, such as Nigeria and Ethiopia? Uh, so I think uh, so this relates probably to the, the, the question to the editors of the book. And yes, I've, we have several works in the book that relate to, to Africa. Uh, Moura Benejamo's work on, on the uh, Green Revolution in, in several African countries and uh, the work of Guillaume Pado on, on uh, uh, wage earning in uh, plantations in, in Cameroon. Uh, and, um, and yes, uh, I mean, there are uh, strong uh, dispossessive uh, policies going on in this particular, uh, in these two particular cases. I think um, these cases don't relate uh, to the two countries that the, 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 the person cited, but um, I think that's something we wanted to, to have in the book. I mean, the, these two chapters on, on dispossession practices in, in Africa, and I think uh, dispossession practices, I mean, if you read David Harvey's text, they're also part of um, uh, imperialistic trends and, and imperialism and, and neo-colonial practices are really uh, part of, uh, of these possessive practices. And I think there are even the, the concepts for which, uh, I mean, the, the events for which the concept of dispossession was elaborated. If you read uh, Rosa Luxemburg and if you read then David Harvey, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the mere idea of uh, dispossession ar arose from, uh, from these uh, African uh, empirical fields, yes. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, maybe you had other questions? Yeah, well, I don't know, Luca, if you want to, to add something, but I, just let me, we don't have too much time left, but I wanted to ask, uh, you know, about sort of the next next plan, or do you plan to have uh, other uh, conferences like the 2019 or other volumes or other research direction? And in particular, Marlene, you, you started your presentation by emphasizing the uh, climate, uh, you know, catastrophic dimension, which then we didn't return too much on this dimension in the presentation. But I, so is this, is this something, you know, is, is this an area where you or, or people in the sort of group, broadly speaking, uh, are doing some work now? Or, or basically, what are the big, what are the next, uh, next plans, uh, Marlene? Oh yes, we would like to um, to organize something like a network, international network, on the on the subject of the of climate and capitalism. So we are focused to, to we are going to focus on this question, on this precise question of uh, of uh, of nature exploitation. And uh, but I think we are going to do that in one year because. Um, everything is stopped now <laughs> because of the situation. So, uh, but yes, this is the next step uh, of our project. And you also have a book uh, going ahead, no? no? And, and you have, uh, uh, you mean yes. the finance authoritaire, yes. No. No, oh, another book, which one? No, but it's not sure, maybe. We are going to have a third book, I think, uh, but I don't want to talk about this uh, now because it's not uh, absolutely done, but maybe it's going to be done uh, on uh, the question of Marxism and ecology uh, with uh, with uh, with author. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. No. Keep keep the, the, the surprise for later. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know, uh, Luca, whether you want to add something or, or uh, Olivia. Um... Just wanted to say, talking about books that are uh, coming out, that um, Thomas uh, Piketty, Amory Guetin, and Clara Martinez uh, have written a book on political privileges and social inequality that is going to be published tomorrow in French. Uh, and the English version is going to be published by Harvard um, in November 2021. So if you want to see the presentation in French, uh, we're going to have, it's going to be our next debate on April the 12th. And, and then we'll have other debate, which we can, uh, so then what do we have in, in May? We have... Uh, uh, so um, on uh, April 12th, we have uh, your uh, book, yeah. and then I, I think it's on the 26th of, uh, sorry, the 18th of May, 
that we're going to have Dominique Meda and Sarah Abdelino. We're going to present their book, uh, Les Nouveaux Travailleurs des Applis. Yes, so that will be in French also. That will be in French. And the following one will be on May the 26th and will be in French as well. Uh, on Race et Sciences Sociales by Stefan Beau and Gerard Noiriel. So the next one in English uh, is going to be on June the 30th. And it's going to be about Latin America and the cost uh, of inequality and, by and Diego Sanchez and Cochia. But before that one, we have Theo and Marlene talking about the finance authoritaire on yes. May, whatever. On Something. June the 9th. On oh, June the 9th. In French. In French. That would be in French. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you very program. much. That's yes. a good program, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, really. So that's great. So thanks, thanks a lot to all of you for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, Anou, Anna, Samuel, Fabien, uh, Marlene, Theo. Thank I think you. it was great to have uh, you know, such a diversity of presentation approaches. And this is really a great book. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Yes. And uh, hopefully see you soon to the next debate. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Very much. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Bye bye. And I don't know when we are able to resume, uh, you know, meeting in person. But I'm afraid that's not, probably not going to be very soon. At least not in the coming weeks. In June, maybe when you present in yes. June, you know, I, we hope we'll we do hope. our best. You know, as soon as we can reopen, uh, you know, the, the place. You know, the, of course. But yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.